Are my expectations up there. Give a warm, warm welcome to Brandon Gasson. Yes, sir. Hey, man, I feel the same way last night. They, these introductions are so amazing. I'm like, who are they talking about? This Brandon Gatson guy. But God is good. Can we celebrate this conference and our leaders at this conference? That's the best you guys can do. Can we celebrate them? Amen. Amen. So um, I do want to do a repeat of last night. If you could just greet like three people that, are, that did not come with you, just go hug them. Tell them that they're amazing. Tell them that they look more like Jesus today. You look fired up. Come on, just go greet somebody. We're going to be with each other for eternity. You might as well get to know them. Tell them something good, something encouraging. Speak a little life in them. I love your hair. Great smile. You are amazing. Come on, praise God. <clears throat> praise the Lord. I also want to thank the tech team for last night. You guys did phenomenal with the verses. Thank you guys so much. And I'll uh, go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for this evening, for this gathering. Once again, God, we just settle in your presence. We just settle our hearts in you. Father, we settle our minds in you. Just thank you, God. Holy Spirit, we just ask that your presence would just rest on us in a greater capacity. I thank you that you anoint all of us in this hour, that you appoint and hmm, that you would give us the grace to be able to hear and receive what you're saying and what you're doing. Father, I pray that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom in spiritual understanding that we might walk worthy of you, Lord, fully pleasing you and being fruitful in every good work that will increase in the knowledge of you, that will be strengthened with might for all patience, long-suffering with joy, Giving thanks unto you, Father, you have qualified us to be partakers of this inheritance. We thank you for this moment. Open up our understanding to comprehend the scriptures. We thank you that your power flow in us and through us. Your love towards us, but then also your love in us. Thank you for changing us tonight. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for your truth tonight. It sets us free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, you know, um, fired up or living on fire is just living in the new you. When you talk about living on fire, you're just living out the new identity you've gained in God. You know, it's easy to, to turn, we could turn things into works where you, you believe you're living on fire because you're witnessing to everyone. And you could turn even evangelism into works and feel like you're on fire because you're doing stuff from God or for him. But the thing that really keeps us on fire is not our works, it's our attitude. 
When I was, when I was uh, studying love, I was blown away because love was defined as an attitude. So let me ask you this question. If I asked you to tell me about a lion's nature, you would tell me that a lion is territorial. You would tell me that a lion is fearless. You would tell me that a lion um, is very, very protective. You would start telling me about a lion's attitude when I asked you to tell me about its nature. Because the way you define nature is through attitude. So when you talk about when you when you talk about God is love, you're defining his nature, but in order to really know what that is, you have to look at the attitudes of love because the attitude is how you define nature. It's easy for me to tell if a person is walking in the nature of God because of their attitudes. Your attitude reveals if you're being led by love or something else. Everyone that gets born again, Romans 5 and 5, the love of God is poured, a shudder brought in your heart by the Holy Spirit. He brings the nature of God in you. The same love that compelled God to send Jesus and the same love that kept Jesus on the cross is in every believer because in heaven, there's only one type of love. So when he gives us his spirit, his spirit brings his nature, and the only way that we can actually walk in the love that we preach about is to take on the attitudes of love. So what Paul begins to explain in 1 Corinthians 13 is the attitudes of love so that we can know when, be, when, when we're being led by love. So when he said love is patient, patience is an attitude. When he said love is kind, kindness is an attitude. I love the amplified version. It does not boil over with jealousy. Jealousy is an attitude. It's not envious. Envious is an attitude. So an attitude is a set way of thinking. So when it says that God love is unconditional, what he's saying is, is that God's attitude towards us it's like, um, this is the definition of agape. It's a set way of thinking that never change. So God is saying, I am choosing to think this way about you, and it's settled, I'm never changing it. So although man fell away from God, lost God's nature, we didn't change God, he changed us. So sin doesn't change his attitude towards you because sin is not changing his nature. So regardless of where people are, his attitude is the same. He's patient towards us. He's kind towards us. He's not uh, 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 looking to exercise si uh, the judgment of sin over us. Here's the thing, when we stand before God, when you're born again, you guys know this, I know a lot of you guys are leaders, but I'll just re-preach this to you. You know, when we got born again, the Spirit of God came in us, so 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says that when we go before God, there's two judgment seats. There's the judgment seat of Christ, and then there's the great white throne. This is the one where people get judged for not receiving salvation. This is the one where he judge you for your works. Christians... Don't go to this judgment because what God judges is not sin, but natures. And when you receive him, he's no longer looking to judge your nature because you have his own. Does that make sense? Over here, though, is why we're looking to live on fire because we're going to be held accountable for the works that we've done in the body, both good or bad. So I'm preaching right now, and God, he's the one that knows this, if I'm preaching out of a pure heart or if I'm preaching out of the building, the platform. I'm going to have to stand before God and give an account for this message and my motives that motivated me to preach. So you can worship in vain, you can pray in vain, you can do all that stuff in vain if your motives is not right. So, 
the attitude of God is reveal, it reveals his nature. Me and your nature, which is God's love, is manifested through our attitude. So living on fire doesn't have anything to do with works. It deals with our attitude, and your attitude would determine what you do. Like the attitude of the lion makes him defend his home, makes him the king of the jungle. He's not the strongest, he's not the biggest, he's not the fastest, but what makes him the king is his attitude. There's no other species that thinks like him. And this is why God likens his son to being like a lion because of the lion's attitude. So when he says, I'm the lion of Judah, he's revealing to us a nature of protection over Judah. And when we receive him, that same nature comes in us. That we reflect both the lion and the lamb. Amen? So, I can tell what's motivating me through my attitude, the way I respond to you. It's not an indictment. I'm not condemning myself, but I, it's like when the Lord started revealing this to me, it helped me because now I'm like, I can, I can almost, I can renew my mind to the point where I know that I'm walking in love daily if I can check my attitude. So the, the first thing we see in Matthew 5 is the B, attitudes. And so he's revealing how to be because this is the way his nature is revealed through us. So you come to church, you sit next to somebody, it's really easy to discern. You probably don't even need the gift for the spirit to discern that. Their countenance is revealing that they probably have a bad attitude and they're not being led in the moment. I've seen preachers, well-known preachers, preach amazing messages and go in the back and treat their armor bearer like a slave. Moving and gifting, but not the nature. Remember this, God's nature is always revealed through our attitude. So it's like a, it's like a man or a woman that's driving to get a brand new car and they get a flat tire. And now they're on the side, side of the road, let's say it's a woman, and she calls her husband and says, baby, my tire's flat. Uh, I'm in California, so I'm on the 405. I'm in the midst of traffic. And he's like, babe, you're in the midst of traffic. I'm at work. It'll take me about an hour and a half to get there. There's a spare tire in the trunk. Just change it. You have the jack? Yes. You have everything you need? Yes. But what she does not have is the understanding of how to use what she's been given. There's things that God has already given us. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the love of God. But when we lack understanding, we can have it and still not know how to use it. So tonight is a night where God wants to activate. He wants to show us how to use what's been given. Amen? Amen? So I don't think I'm going to preach long tonight because I have to let you loose to reveal Christ in you. So look at your name and say, tonight, my attitude is, if you have sickness, disease, pain in your body, it's leaving tonight because I'm sitting next to you and I'm going to pray. And when I do, my attitude is it's getting out you know faith you got listen to have faith you got to have a little attitude to tell king nebuchadnezzar i'm not bowing to you and i'd rather go in the fire you got to have a little attitude to think like that to say throw me in the dens with the lions because my king is the lion of Judah. There's a militancy to faith. And I remember when I used to get ready to pray for people, and I was just going to kind of follow the Lord, I mean. When I used to get ready to pray for people, I would get this sensation in my hand. 
And it was like confirmation. I knew they were about to be healed. How many of you guys ever felt that? You just felt God's presence. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is a done deal. I'm going to pray God's going to do this. And it was like the Lord took it from me. And here's what the Lord was trying to get me to do. Never live by sensualism. We don't need to feel anything to see God move. We go in church and we need to sense the anointing. We need to feel stuff. Feelings is a zero in faith. I start praying to God. I was just start telling him, I don't need to feel anything. I want raw faith in my life. Just raw faith. Last night was so amazing to me. It just always encourages me because I'm prophesying to people and there's different times. So sometimes you're prophesying and you're like, you're hearing a voice, you're getting an impression. I'm prophesying to people out of the confidence of truth in my heart because I'm not feeling anything. And just the response, oh my God, man of God, you hit this and you knew this and you knew that. And I'm thinking, I just spoke out of faith. Didn't see nothing. Wasn't taking in a vision. I just remember Romans 12 that said when you prophesy, you prophesy according to faith, not feelings. So we don't need to feel anything to know that God is moving. We don't need to feel anything to know that we're in faith. Faith is a viewpoint. It's the word pistis. It means perspective. So, the doctor tells you, you're diagnosed with cancer, you have three months to live. He just gave you a certain viewpoint. The word faith in the Bible is the word pistis. Pistis means conviction. And conviction means a point of view. So, if I ask you right now, what's your favorite color? So, people just start, what's your favorite color? Blue, what's yours? White, what's yours, sir? Blue, what's your favorite color? Purple, yours. Now, what's the best color in the world? Red, what's, your, what's, your, what's the best color in the world? Red, what's the best color in the world? Red color, so what, purple. So, watch this, what'd you say? Blue, green, red, going go on once. Red going on once, going on twice, one, okay. But watch this. What you just gave me was your personal conviction, your viewpoint, your opinion. That's what faith is. Faith is a certain view. It's a certain way that we see. You guys okay if I just take my time really quick? Is that okay? Okay. So the doctor says you have three months to live. You have cancer. He just gave you his view based on what he sees. Faith is the same definition, but it, it's used in the reverse fashion, where the word faith is the word pistis. Pistis means conviction. Conviction means a way of seeing. So he tells you you're going to die, but you give him Jesus' view. I hear what you're saying, but the view that I see is that this thing is crushed in my body because of what he accomplished. That's living by faith. It's living by conviction in what God has said or the view that God has. So anytime in your life your view matches God's view, you know that you're living in faith. So that viewpoint doesn't need a feeling. It doesn't need emotions. It doesn't need sensualism. All it needs to know is the way that God sees. How does God see the situation? That's how I want to see the situation. And when I allow that to dominate the way I live my life, I'm living in faith. So there's like three tiers of faith. The first level of faith is just a regular belief. It's, a, it's what you see when you meet people and you ask them if, if they have faith. And they say, yeah, I have a general faith. I just believe things will work out in life. I'm very hopeful that this situation will change. I have a, a, a general belief that good will triumph over evil. But it's not a faith in a direct target, in a direct object. It's just a, it's like a, um, a nebulous faith 
that just believes that some way, somehow, things are going to work together. That's the first line of faith. The second tier of faith that the Bible talks about is faith in a direct object, and that's Jesus. This faith allows you to become the righteousness of God. This faith allows you to be born again. This faith fills you with the Spirit of God. This faith makes you a son of God. The third level of faith is when the scriptures now begin to dictate what you do and how you approach life. It's where you actually start to establish dominion over the world around you. Biblical faith or faith in what God is saying and not just who he is will cause you not to say certain things because you believe that death and life is in the power of your tongue. And because you actually have faith in that, you do not say certain things. So now your life is actually being driven by your faith. And the just now is living by faith. And that type of faith doesn't require any emotions. It just requires a certain viewpoint. The Lord wants us to graduate to the place where we're actually led by and position our life around what we believe. Amen? I want to show you a couple of things. Just go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. <clears throat> Perfect. Do you guys have the New King James Version? New King James, this is the e ESV. You guys, mind if I just fire myself up right now? I just feel like just cranking myself up. I just thank God that tonight, faith is gonna go to an all-time high. Father, I just thank you right now that tonight you're just so stirring us in faith. You're stirring us in faith that even tonight, we didn't come to see a man. We didn't come to just gather around people. We came in faith, a viewpoint that you would personally encounter us, that you will work something in our heart tonight that would change the way we see life, that you will break any perspective, any view that's not yours. Any view of ourself, any view of God or people that does not reflect your perspective, you will break tonight. I take authority in the name of Jesus over every type of stronghold, religious strongholds that would teach us to do church as usual, to come and expect nothing. I thank you that you would erase our perspective, even of your word, and you would charge us in a new way. I thank you now for such a revelation, such an insight to teach us your way in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. On the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Verse 2. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were what? Invited to the... Now, this is interesting because Jesus himself came to the earth for a bride. And now, the first place that he goes is to a wedding. He understands the value of the wedding because that's what he's coming for. And it was wisdom of the people not just to invite his mother, but they invited Jesus. Anytime you want to create an atmosphere for a miracle, you have to invite him. Amen? Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. 
3. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So this word hour means my designated time to start doing miracles is not today. I'm supposed to start next week. This is off schedule. Remember, Jesus is only saying what the Father is what? So this is not the Father's time to do a miracle. Imagine you praying and God said, hey, I want to do this for you, but I'm not supposed to do it this month. That's for December. Next verse. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Verse 6. Now there were six, now there were set there six water parts of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 to 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. Now watch this. He said it wasn't time for him to do any miracles. But when his mother turned to start speaking to the servants, he began to respond to her concern, not because it's just her concern. One of the reasons he's responding is because they ran out of wine. They came to an end of what they had. They realized that what they had wasn't sufficient. They came to an end of themselves. It's one thing to invite Jesus into something. It's another to see your need for him. Because he comes to a lot of weddings and we still haven't ran out of wine. So we're still taking authority. We're still living through our efforts to supply our needs. We're still living through our own personal view and not the way that God sees things. We're born again but still seeing things the same way. Okay, we're going to come back to this. Can you go to Genesis? Go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And I am at verse 8. Genesis 2, verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. If you have a Bible, your phone, highlight verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. Oh, they're on point. You guys are rolling. And out of the ground, so do me a favor, go back to verse 8. Go back to verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden where? Eastward, right? Remember eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Watch this though. The tree of life, oh, can you go back? The tree of life was also in the, not eastward, So the trees that are eastward are the ones that are pleasant to the eyes and good for food. You would have looked at this tree and said, mm, girl, that look good. You want this apple? This apple look bomb, girl. And she was like, yes, give me the apple. She's been fasting. She's like, give me the apple. 
But the trees that are eastward looks good for food. They're pleasant to the eyes. But the trees he's placed in the middle doesn't look good to the eyes, nor do they look pleasant for food. How do we know that? Because Jesus told them not to eat from the tree that's in the midst of the garden. James 1 tells us that God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt people. But every person is tempted when they are drawn away by their own lust. So Jesus wouldn't put a tree in the garden that looks good and tell you not to eat from it. He will be tempting you. So the trees that, in the, that are in the midst of the garden looks different from the trees that are eastward in the garden. Okay? Are we together? Now Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, watch this, and he said to the woman, has God indeed said to you, I said that you should not eat of the tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the tree, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the what? Mist of the garden. God has said you should not eat nor touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows, verse 3, But the, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat nor touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your what? Will be open and you will be like God knowing good and so he's he's not after her heart right now he's after her perspective because her perspective is the way she sees god has already told her he's already given god has given them already his perspective you're healed sickness is not going to consume you death is not your portion I'm going to take care of your needs. Lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. He gives you his view. That's his perspective. Satan comes and says, well, are you sure? Are you sure it's God's will to heal? Are you sure that God wants to do this? Well, what's going on? Because if it was God's will, wouldn't he have done it by now? He starts to sell us a different view because he wants to change the way that we're seeing the situation. So he's selling her a different view, not by talking about, he's not talking about demonic things. He starts to preach a sermon on God to change the way that she sees. That's the danger of religion. It presents a view that God has not given you. It contains the presence of God, not releases him. It put limitations on us. You think that you can only live as good as the pastor. But you're called to be like Christ. Verse 4, or 5, or 6, I'm sorry. So, watch this, watch this. So, when the woman saw, was she blind? She was seeing the whole time. But something looks different now. So when the woman saw that the tree that's in the mist was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of, it, of its fruit and ate. Wait a minute. This tree is in the mist, and when she first looked at the tree, it didn't look good. It wasn't pleasant to the eyes. It wasn't tempting. All of a sudden, she's still filled with the Spirit of God, but she's not seeing the way that God sees. So I can be filled with God and still see the tree wrong. He 
He's already changed her view. She hasn't ate yet, but she's already seeing different. Can you go back a verse? Oh, no, this is perfect. Watch this. Look at this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now this tree doesn't look like the way God intended. She still got the spirit of God in her. She hasn't ate yet, but she's not seeing like God. So you and I can be filled with the Spirit and still seeing wrong. Feel but still have racism. Feel but still have prejudice. Feel but still don't embrace who we are in Christ. And here's the issue. When he changes the way you see, then you eat. Your actions begin to produce the way you see. So eating it's not even a big deal. The big deal is the way that she sees. Because if God can change the way you see, he could change your whole life. Your eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is single, if you see one way, your whole body is flooded with light. So everything is about how you're seeing it. How do you see the person next to you? What's your view on them? Is your attitude set to love them? Or are you seeing it from the impressions of the world? Are you being inspired by the way that you grew up? Because the way that we grew up wasn't the way that God cr created us or raised us. We were homeschooled in the wrong home. Our institutions taught us. Hollywood taught us. Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella. Now she's waiting on the prince to come and rescue her, and her life is not fulfilled till she gets married. So she comes to church now, gets born again. She's 35, and she feels like she's missing out on life. She's depressed in the pastor's office, needing counseling now because of the way that she sees. And she has God now, and God is so supposed to be the, the fulfillment of her life, but she don't feel fulfilled because she's still drawing her relational perspective from Hollywood. She doesn't need deliverance. She needs her eye changed. This is why Jesus says, and you should know the truth, and the truth should make you. Truth is defined as God's reality. You will see God's reality, and then it frees you from the reality you had before. So now she's seeing different. And the tree looks good, and it looks desirable. I'm going to quote this verse again, James 1, I think it's verse 14. It says that when a man is tempted, he is drawn away by his own desires. What drew her away? And a tree desirable to make one wise. He created a different desire in her from the way he calls her to see. That's lust. That's pornography. That's masturbation and fornication. He creates a lust in people, a desire in people by making them look at the woman in a perverted way. Oh, she looks so good. I know I'm saved. And then you're trying to bite your lip to change because you know it's not the nature of God, but you haven't changed the way you see. So now you're living out of works because you're still seeing like the old man and you're trying not to sin. Versus letting God change the way you see and you can see her now according to the image of God that he's created her. You can honor her beauty without going into perversion and needing to sleep with her. Or scroll through Instagram to see how good he looks. That's just one aspect. You can use finances. People being driven by poverty and think because they're rich, they don't have a poverty spirit. You can be rich and still be in poverty because poverty is leading your life. The fear of being poor is driving you. And now you have finances out of fear and you think it's God blessing you. And that's the wrong view. Why does he have to get up and, and give perspective on giving. 
Because in a room like this, people got 99 reasons why they shouldn't give because of their experience, their view of pastors and churches. Now we got to convince the family of God to help us put on something for free. Because our view is still of the world. And we think because we use verses, it's spiritual. Or because we use Jesus' name, it's spiritual. So we just try to tag Jesus on all these different things and think that it becomes holy because we use his name. Christian mingle. Now we feel better mingling because we put Christian in front of it. So now we test drive women and men in the name of the Lord. And not just believe that he can lead us to the woman of our life and save this sister heartbreak from you experimenting with her. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So what he grabbed, he grabbed their eye from the way she sinned created a desire. This is how desires are born. You can actually control your life. So what uh, uh, David talked about, about guarding your heart. Desires aren't just there. Desires are born. Five years ago, I was crazy by the X5 BMW. That was the car I wanted. I want an X5. And I'm the kind of dude that has the kind of faith that goes to the dealership and test drive the car and I have maybe $30 in my account. I was in college. And I'm test driving, like, oh yeah, so show me the features. And he's thinking I'm ready to buy. And I'm gonna show me the features. Okay, so what's the kind of plans you have? And I'm, I mean, I'm taking up this man's time, but to him it may be a waste of time. To me, it's faith. So I'm crazy by X5. And all of a sudden, BMW comes out with this new make, this X6. Now, as long as I don't see it, I'm fine. But I just so happened to be watching TV and seeing a commercial of this X6. And now I want it. It's become a desire because I seen it. Desires don't come from nothing. Whatever you give your attention to will create a desire. So if I want to stay married and be faithful, I just don't give my attention that way to her. Even though she may be a nice looking young lady, God bless you, I don't give my attention to her in a certain way. And that keeps the desire from being unborn. It keeps me seeing the tree as being unpleasurable and it doesn't look good to my taste buds and I can keep seeing the tree in the east side of the garden my wife the way I need to see her and I'll pick from her tree and eat her fruit and those seeds are getting me and we can reproduce so you can actually control your desires you have to watch what you give your attention to so if I want to desire more of God, guess what I need to do? Give more of my attention to him. Behold him. Son, Proverbs 4, 24, son, attend to my words. Keep them before your eyes. Why? They give birth to desire. You can tell when your fire is going out, it's easy to tell it's when your attention is somewhere else other than God. So we can just keep our eyes on him and our minds on him. Our desire will continually be him. That's why I love the testimonies of angels and, and the miracles. What it does, it keeps my eye on him and it gives this desire in me to want more. I want more fire. What? Well, God did that. He did this. Man, it, it makes me want more. The testimony of what's possible in a man that's submitted to grace. So now she eats. She took over the ate his fruit. She also 
gave it to her husband. This is just like the story we're about to go back to. Satan didn't need to say anything to Adam. Why? He discipled what Adam had his eye on. His wife. Why do people sin? They're drawn away by their own lust, own desire, right? Did he sin? So there had to be a desire somewhere. What was his desire for? His wife. You guys remember this. He's in deep sleep. He's knocked out. He's like, he took some NyQuil. <laughs> he wakes up like, oh, flesh of my flesh. Girl, you looking like a bone of my bone. For this cause, see, God didn't marry them. Adam did. God didn't say this. Adam said this. He said, for this cause. So he's looking at something that looked good. For this cause. He called her this. Like this is it. For this cause shall a man leave his father and leave his mother and cling to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. His desire was for the woman. So Satan didn't even have to come talk to him to convince him to eat. He went to where his desire was because now he's being led by what he sees. And Peter reveals that Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't, the Bible said. That he absolutely knew, but he yielded to the voice of his wife. And that's what God said in chapter 3. Because you have heeded to the voice of your wife. So what is God saying? How does Satan try to get us? He tries to find where your desire is and use that to bait you. Jesus said it like this, wherever your treasure is. So that's why we can't have any treasures on earth. This is why I can't love money. This is why I can't have an over, a over access love for my wife. Because then she'll become the thing that he tried to use to get to me. This is why Jesus said, if you don't, if you don't hate your, your mother, your father... You're not worthy of following me. What does hate mean in that verse? Love less. Because then that'll be the thing that he uses to grab us. You're doing well. You're serving God. Oh, three months and I'm just free from this and free from that. And then he says, hmm, did I hear her say she was afraid that her son wouldn't serve God? So he says, okay, no, no, no. Don't try to bring the alcohol back. Let's go after the son. And now he goes after the son, and now that messes up your whole prayer life because now he found out where your desire was, and he's taking your eyes off your Savior, and you're looking at everything your child doing that's wrong, and, and now you're praying, and Lord, please, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord, my baby. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. And God's like, this is not covenant. This is not the way we see. You've aimed from the tree. And he's like, got her. And that doesn't change until you release Faith in what God said about your son. What's God's view of him? What's God's perspective of this man of God? I'm not just praying because I'm his mother. I'm praying from a higher place. He's called to be a kingdom ambassador. You want to use me to bring him here. That's more to his life than just being my child. You don't reduce your family to being your family. That's just the context that God wanted to use to bring out purpose in his will. Not for you to have this, 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 I can't do life because of my family. What if Jesus was like that? He would have been broken because his brother didn't even believe he was the son of God. Who is my father and my mother? I'll tell you. He said, those that do the will of my father. Not my father, my, who, who is my mother and my brothers and my sisters? Those who do the will of my father. He said, I, even though I'm born of Joseph and Mary, I'm not seeing who I am through them. I'm seeing myself through them. Joseph and Mary came looking for Jesus. He's 12. Where is he? He's in the temple, and they, he, he's answering questions and being asked questions. And they came to him and said, hey, we've been looking for you for three days. Why have you done this to us? 
why you done this to your parents? And he's like, excuse me, I must be about my father's business. What is he teaching Mary? Don't overly cling to me. You brought me here, but I'm not yours. Matthew 23, 9, Jesus said, call no man your father, for one is your father, the one is in heaven. He's saying when you get born again, you no longer have a right to biologically draw your DNA from your mother and father. So you don't have to worry about a generational curse because you're not even in the same bloodline anymore. You have a new father now. So if alcohol plagued my dad, my granddad, my great-great-granddad, I'm not concerned about it anymore because I'm no longer in line for it because I have a new father. So if it tries to show up, I know it's a lie trying to change the way I see. And faith teaches me, even though I may feel the temptation to drink, feeling it isn't wrong. For feeling it is. We think we're in sin because we feel the pressure. Jesus tempted 40 days. He was hungry. He felt that. It's not temptation if he doesn't feel it. He feels that. So I'm not in sin if I hear the devil and if I feel him 40 days straight. And I don't need to call 30 people to pray with me on a prayer chain. I need to know what's written. Thus it is written. Men don't live by bread alone. And I'm living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Everyone will have the privilege to deal with him one-on-one. -on -one. It's a privilege because you get to show him you're not changing the way I see. We together? So she gave to her husband. He was with her. And he ate. Watch this. This is amazing. Then the eyes of both, hers was already changed, but now both of them. Then the eyes of both of them were open. Open. So you mean to tell me God had their eyes closed? There were certain things God closed their eyes to because he knew if he let them see what it would lead to. So I don't need to try to open something God has closed. I don't know why this is coming up, but opening the door again to your ex. And you know God closed that relationship on purpose. Opening the door to conversations you know God has already settled in your life. Keep it closed. Look at your neighbor and say, keep it closed. And they knew they were naked, and they sewed thick leaves together, and they made themselves coverings. Now their whole life now, watch this, now everything they're doing now is because of how they see. Because how you see determines what you do. Because I see, I'm not going to walk into this bench. My eyes will tell me, go this direction. Go this direction. Because your eyes are designed to lead you. So whatever you see determines how you would go. This is why Paul prayed that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Because if your spiritual eyes come open, you'll be able to follow God in his direction. I went to go get a massage, and the lady that was giving me a massage, when she turned me over, she said, do you want me to open up your third eye? What I told her, I said, ma'am, it's already open. I said, have you heard of the Holy Spirit? This is what got me. She's been in L.A. 15 years, and she's born in Jerusalem and never even heard of the Holy Spirit. So now I have to explain him from scratch. But when I was inquiring about this third eye, the
the Lord took me to what I'm showing you now. And he showed me this is how Satan opens up people's eyes to see things that God had never intended for them to see. And we're in California. I start prophesying to her, giving her words of knowledge, and she was already used to hearing prophetic stuff because she isn't tapped in something else that gave her eyes to see. But John 10, Jesus said, if you try to come into this realm of seeing any other way outside of me, you are a thief and you're a robber. He said, I'm, he said that uh, Jesus is at your door. Maybe he quoted that earlier, Revelations. He said, Jesus is at your door. That's amazing because Jesus himself is a door. But you're made in his image. So he wants to open you up to something, but you can open yourself up to other stuff. Stuff that he wants to keep closed. So, it's not that the devil's after your heart. He's after your eyes. Because Jesus said if he gets your eyes, he gets your whole body. That includes your heart. So your perspective right now determines what you do. So faith is a viewpoint. And this gives you the ability to change the way you see. This is why he works so hard to keep us out of this. This is why he works so hard to make this just a devotional book and not one that changes us. He wants you just to feel good that you read this morning. But as long as it doesn't change the way you see, you're not a threat to him. So you can read this and stay the same. Forty years with God and still think the same. Faithful to church, but never become the church. Saltless salt. You guys okay? You guys, I mean, y'all, I'm, I'm dishing out some strong stuff and y'all just eating it. Y'all must be hungry for Jesus. My God, like, none of you, no one has gotten up and walked out. I don't care about them. I see the way I want to see. Look at your attitude. I can tell what you're being led by. Okay, y'all want to finish this John 2? Is that okay we finish John 2? You just enjoy. I just, I'll do all the work. You just sit there and just... Just receive. Ministers, we're servants. I'm just serving you my portion. Amen. I just want to serve you. So you grab your phone, record. You just enjoy. Just let it go in, okay? John 2, can y'all can celebrate the tech team? Ain't they just doing such an amazing job? The booth, you guys are off the hook. Take me back to John 2, and then we'll get into moving in faith. God's what? Amen. That's what we're going to move in tonight. And guess what happens when you move in faith? Miracles. So you, you prophesied and told your neighbor that you was going to pray for them and that they were going to be healed. That's what you said. So I'm just going to hold you to your word. All right? It's going to be okay. Okay, so we read this on the third day. There was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Verse number two. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Three, <clears throat> and when they had ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Watch his view. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. That's her view. <laughs> now, there are six, now there were set there six water pots of stone 
according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 to 30 gallons of peace. So this is custom. When you went to a Jewish wedding, you would go there, and wherever you came from, obviously you would bring the dirt from wherever you came from. It would be on your feet, it would be on your hands. So you would go to one of these water pots, wash your hands, wash your feet, and then you'll go into the wedding. So these water pots are filled with people's dirt from their past. Wherever they came from, whatever they past was, they just brought it and they just wash their hands and their feet, and now this water pot is filled with the dirt from your past. Next verse. Jesus said to them, fill it up. To the brim. Then draw some out. And take it to the master of the feast. And they took these water pots that had the dirt from the past to the master of the feast. And he gave it to him. He took it. And what was dirty water was transformed into wine. They already had wine at the wedding, but they ran out. They came to an end of what they had, and now they needed the one who invited them to the wedding to give them what he has. They ran out of what they had. So now they needed Jesus, who is at the wedding, to give them what he had. What did he have? Their dirt. What did he transform? Their dirt from their past. So what really was the miracle? The miracle was his ability to transform your life into something completely different. That he was served to people, and they would say, wait a minute. I know what we had was really good, but you have saved the best wine until now. And he didn't know he was drinking his dirt transformed. Jesus' ability to transform your life is the, the miracle of water to wine. But what does he need? An invitation to your wedding. What does he need? You to come to an end of what you have. What does he need? The dirt of your past. Here's the other beautiful part. Jesus didn't take the wine to the master of the feast. The servants did. Because it's our responsibility to serve people what he's done. That's living on fire. And what did he do? He took my past transformed it. Amen. And I'll just read this out. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from. See, when you deliver this wine, the world don't know where it came from. They don't know about Jesus. But look at this. But the servants who draw who had drawn the water knew. 
So the servants knew where it came from. It came from Jesus. But the ones that was drinking didn't know. The, the, feast, oh, the feast called the bridegroom. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. Why? Uh, I won't go why right now. It's amazing. 10. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. Verse 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. Last verse. Watch this. Look at this. And his disciples, what? Believed in him. Not his words yet. They just believed in Jesus. Now watch this. I'm in the same chapter. John chapter 2. Actually, I'm going to go to John. <clears throat> I'm in John chapter 2. Just go down to verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. <clears throat> when he had made a whip of coins, he, uh, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And when you raise it up on, in three days... But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples, remember what we talked about last night? The power of remembering? His disciples remembered that he said this to them, and they believed the, the first time they believed in him, but it wasn't until after Jesus raised from the dead that they start to believe the scriptures. It's one thing to believe in Jesus. I confess he's my savior. I confess my body. It's another thing to believe you're healed and sickness won't touch your body because you believe what he said. Believe in him and the scriptures. Believing in him changes your eternal state. Believing in the scriptures changes your current state. It changes how you do life. It changes how you see. It changes your perspective. So it's normal, though, to start off believing in Jesus. And as we grow, we learn to believe his scriptures. How do we build a desire for him and his word? By giving our attention to what he said. Man, is that good? All right, last thing. Go to, it's only 8.30. Did you guys bring your, did you, did you guys bring your pillows and blankets? I'll preach until Jesus comes back. No, we're, amen, we're, we're, almost, we're almost at a conclusion, amen, I, now, I feel like the Lord just set a foundation, I'm going to show you Jesus' view, and now, 
Well, and after that, we're going to move in faith according to the scriptures. How many of you guys believe in Jesus? Okay. So you have faith in him. How many of you guys believe in the scriptures? That's what we're going to exercise tonight. Our faith in the scriptures and what he said. Do you need to feel anything? Do you need to feel the anointing? You just need the right view. All right. So I'm in Matthew 10. Matthew 10. And I'll look at verse. Uh, I'll just I'll start at verse 5. Start at verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the city of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, saying what, guys? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Interesting because this, is, this just means so much to me. At this point, none of the disciples have the Holy Spirit in them. John, John 3, 34. Go to John 3, 34. John 3, 34. Um, look at this verse. John is talking about Jesus. And he says, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the spirit by measure. So he's talking about Jesus. And he said that Jesus doesn't have just the measure of Holy Spirit. He has all of Holy Spirit. So what that means is that Holy Spirit, all of who he is, is in Jesus. But you and I just read in Matthew 10 that Jesus commissioned the apostles to go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Like, can I say some strong stuff? Are you guys okay? Let me see your hands. Are you guys okay? All right. This is, this, this is amazed me. Jesus just sent them to do those four things without the Holy Ghost. So these brothers are raising the dead, healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons without the Holy Spirit. Go to Luke chapter 10. Let's do verse 17. If we won't start there, but if you started, if you started at verse one, when you go home, you start at verse one. You guys already know this, but you'll see that Jesus sent out 70 more people to go with the apostles that he told to do the same thing. So you have 82, 82 total that he's commissioned to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, do all these things. Okay. So the 72 came back to Jesus. This is what happened. Then the 72 returned with joy. They was excited saying, Lord. Even the demons are what? 
They didn't have Holy Spirit, but what did they have? His name. You remember Matthew 7, 24, when Jesus said, not everybody said to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But those who do the will of my Father, that they're going to come before him and say, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. Did signs and wonders in your name. And Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. So they were able to do miracles simply through his name and not even be in relationship with God and not even be born again. Why? Because there's power simply in his name. This is why when you pray for people to be healed, it's not your fancy prayer that heals them. It's not your three-minute prayer speaking in tongues. It's the authority in his name. They're not even born again. As a matter of fact, the same 70, if you went to John 6, they left him. Jesus started preaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And, and they said, who can stand this message? And they left. And Jesus said to his disciples, are you guys going to leave me too? And Peter said, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. So the 70 left him, but the Bible never said they stopped doing ministry. They probably kept doing it because it brought them notoriety. And they ran into a principle that the name of Jesus will heal people, and we don't even have to be in a relationship. And we can just build conferences and, th and, do, and do events and gatherings and just use his name and get money from people. And people that think because they see signs and wonders, it got to be God. Because they're not looking for the nature of God. They're just looking for signs and wonders. So the very elect can be deceived if you're just going by miracle signs and wonders. But what Satan can never produce is something outside of his nature, the love of God. So John 13, 34 says, a new commandment I give you, that you should love one another the way that I love you by this. People will know that you are my disciples. Wait a minute, we casting out devils? We healing the sick? No, no, no. By this, people will know that you're my follower because of the love you have for one another. First John 3, 14, this is how you know you pass from death to life because you love the brethren, not because you speak in tongues. You can have tongues and angels and or men and have not love, and you are sounding brass, a clinging symbol. You can have faith to move all mountains and understand all the mysteries, and have not love, and you still profit you nothing. Moving in all the gifts and mission the nature of God, and think God is consenting you because you have a gift. It's his nature that reveals him. It's his attitude that shows who he is. This is why he said, love your enemies. What he said, that your attitude towards them is what really reflects that I'm in you. We, rec we see that there's a Judas. We cut Judas off. Jesus broke bread with him. He wasn't intimidated by Judas. And he didn't come out with a bunch of DVDs saying, watch out for the spirit of Judas. He cut covenant with him, communion. This is my blood, take, drink, my body, broken for you. He who dips his hand in here is the one that will betray me. Knew it, never called him out, never put him on blast, never put him on social media, never put him on IG, never exposed it. The one that put their hand in there, giving him an opportunity not to put his hand in there. Here's what I love about it though, it's, and this is why I don't like religion, but you see something very unique about Judas. What is repentance? A change of mind, a change of heart. We say it's when you do the opposite, when you go the opposite way. Did Judas repent? Did he take the silver back to the people? And say, oh, I betray innocent blood. 
He took it back to religious people that wouldn't embrace him, that wouldn't accept him. Oh, we can't take what you have, Judas. That's blood money. We can't see you outside of what you did. And they condemned him to death. People that want to keep seeing you the same way. Unforgiveness. I forgive you, but I don't have to like you. I'll love you from a distance. That's still seeing them as Judas. All day they repented. They're bringing back civil and you won't embrace them. Because your attitude is not reflecting his nature. You're seeing different. And we're saying we're the salt. God send me. God use me. Oh, God bless me with this and bless me with that. And he's like, why would I bless you and you're operating a nature don't re that doesn't reflect me? And it'll look like I'm rewarding that nature if I did. And we'll think it's spiritual warfare. Oh, man of God, can y'all intercede? Can you pray for me? Can, there's something in my life. I feel like I just can't get to the place I'm trying to get in. Every door closed. And he's like, wait a minute, I deserve Did you forgive your husband, your ex? Well, yeah, yeah I forgave him. I just, I don't talk to him, but I forgave him. Are you still seeing him according to what he did to you? Are you still a victim in your mind? Because if that's the case, we don't know. I, I can't even pray. I can't change nothing. You got unforgiveness in your heart. And Jesus said in Matthew 18 that you got to be given over to the, the tormentors and they got to torment you until you forgive. I can't, I can't pray you out of this. I, I can't pray you out of you receiving the love of God, but you're not becoming it towards others. There's nothing I can do about that. God does it towards us first so that we can become like him. He gives us mercy first so we can become merciful. He gives us love first so we can become love. He don't, he, see, here's how some people think. They just want the love of God towards them, but not in them. They want God to be good to them, but they don't want to become that goodness to others and be his image and likeness in the earth. When you do that, you stop the flow of God because he can't go past what he's done for you through his son. He wants to flow out of you. His life wants to flow out of you, but it can't because you're grieving Holy Spirit by trying to operate in a nature that you don't even have anymore. That old man is crucified with Christ. And now it's just Christ living, but now you're choosing to think this way. It's not the devil. It's a choice. Eve sinned, and it wasn't from the nature of the devil in her. She was filled with God and chose to sin. She's not sinning because Satan had her filled and she was possessed and then she sinned. She was filled with God and chose to sin. She's a picture of the covenant that we have now, that you can be filled with God and choose to sin. It's not the old nature. You've been set free from that thing. Paul kept saying over and over, you've died with Christ. The old man is put to death. Now you don't, don't allow sin to have domain over your body. Why? Because now you have a choice. So when a believer sins now, it's not because they can't help it. They want to. They choose to. You cannot tell me the spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead and took a man and put a man next to God is in you and you can't stop sinning. Are you kidding me? Holy Spirit in us. But what is God trying to do? Change the way we see. So they're moving in power simply through his name. It's not your fancy prayers. They didn't fast first. They didn't read a bunch of verses first. He told them to go, lay your hands on the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, raise the dead, and they just went. Because the Lord is trying to show us, even right there with people that are not even born again, that the thing that always brought results is his name. And if you can say the name of Jesus, you can change people's outcome. Two more verses and I'm done. Matthew, 
Matthew uh, 28. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, we'll start at verse 18. Let's jump down to verse 18. <clears throat> this is, you guys know this, this is the great commission what Jesus told the apostles. He said, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, go back really quick. Who said this? Who said this? He said all authority has been given to who? So who has all authority? Who? So when you use his name, his name reflects what he has. So when we pray, his name begins to demonstrate the authority that he has. Because it's been given to Jesus. It's like if, so I use this, it, I had, I had uh, four brothers and sisters, four siblings. I had two brothers and two sisters. And if I came, I was a baby boy, and then I have a little sister after me. If I came into my brother's room, my oldest brother room, and said, hey, go wash the dishes. Now, how many of you guys are, are you, you have younger siblings? Let me see your hand. Now, what do you say to your younger sibling if they tell you, go wash the dishes? This is a go. All right, I like that. Go. Get out of here. Talk to the hand. See, that's authority. Talk to the hand. But when I come in there and say, hey, Mama said, go wash the dishes. See, the first time he came, he didn't have the confidence. He's like, go wash the dishes. It's your turn to wash the dishes. Go. She's like, go. Talk to the hand. So now he goes. And, <laughs> and then Mama said, what's wrong, boy? Well, Brian said he's not going to wash the dishes. And it's his turn. Go and tell Brian... I said. Now, why do parents talk like that? Why do they say stuff like, I said? Because they have what? So now, when mother says that to him, he's empowered because who told him? So now he comes back in there and says, mama said. Go wash them dishes. And guess what we get up to go do? We wash the dishes because of mama's name, her title, and the authority she has. So the name of Jesus is like that. When you come and say, Jesus said, come out of her. Be healed. Be delivered. It has a different kind of weight because of the authority that he carries. Next verse. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next verse. Here we go. Teaching them, that would be us, teaching them to observe how many things? All things I have commanded you. Did he command them to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you receive, freely you give? So they were supposed to teach us the same thing Jesus taught them. So till this day, we're supposed to be continuing what he taught the apostles. And guess what he gave them to do all four of those things? His name. So guess what we're going to do tonight? We're going to release the power of his name. And guess what's going to happen? People are going to start getting healed. That's my perspective. It's his. I believe in Jesus. I also believe in the scriptures. 
Why? He's turned my water into wine. The servants didn't drink it. They become it and serve it to others. Man? So we're going to create a buffet really quick and do some things. How many of you guys in here have any kind of pain, deficiencies, aches, tension in your body? Just lift your hands up. Okay. So look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you promised me. Yeah. <laughs> you was going to pray for me. And I was going to get healed. Give me what you promised. Tell me, give me what you promised. All right, we're going to have some fun. Can we loosen up a little bit? Okay, so everybody stand up really quick and just shake or do something, stretch. And put your hand on your heart really quick. Holy Spirit, there's a lot of things that were said tonight, and I thank you that it all is sown in good ground. And that what we preach tonight, what was said tonight, would just be the foundation that you will build greater truths in them in their com communion and intimacy with you, that you would expand this and that it go down deep, and that we'll live by faith and that your nature would consume us and our attitudes will be yours. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Now, Father, thank you for the shifting of grace that you would just allow this to take us into a time of miracles, signs, and wonders so that we can be stirred to live on fire in the world around us. We thank you for it now. We bless you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. So